Good afternoon and welcome to the 2019 OR Today webinar series. We're excited to have over 150 registered attendees for today's webinar. OR Today is focused on giving back to the perioperative community through our monthly magazine, website, and annual OR Today live surgical conference and expo. So let's kick off today's webinar by giving an OR Today live surprise pack to the attendee that can tell me what city will host our 2019 OR Today live surgical conference. Use the question feature on your webinar dashboard to answer now. While you're answering, I want to remind you to complete the post-webinar survey, which will appear immediately on your computer screen at the end of today's call. One lucky attendee will have the opportunity to win an Amazon gift card, courtesy of OR Today, just for completing the survey. Please know that today's webinar is not eligible for a continuing education credit. Okay, and let's see who the winner of our OR Today Live Surprise Pack is. And it is Sam Lamuro. Sam, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Congratulations. Uh, 2019 OR Today Live Surgical Conference and Expo will be held August 18th to 20th at the Palms Casino Resort and Spa in Las Vegas. Visit ortodaylive.com for more information. OR Today would like to thank our sponsor, BD. BD is a global medical technology company that is a innovative solutions that help advance medical research and genomics, enhance the diagnosis of infection, disease and cancer, improve medication management, promote infection prevention, equip surgical and interventional procedures, and support the management of diabetes. For more information, visit bd.com. Our presenter today is Lena Pearson, Medical Science Liaison. Infection Prevention, Surgical and Interventional Specialist for BD's Infection Prevention Division. Lena, you may begin whenever you're ready. Thank you, Laura. So as Laura had introduced me, my name is Lena Pearson. I am a Medical Science Liaison for BD, or Becton Dickinson, in the Infection Prevention Division. I have a responsibility for exchanging unbiased information in the healthcare community as subject matter expert. So today we're going to talk a little bit about vacuum-assisted hair removal in the OR, the value and optimization. So let's start our agenda, or our webinar today, with the agenda. We're going to look at the clinical rationale for clipping. Why are we clipping, or why shouldn't we clip? Why do we clip it, the hair prior to surgery? How it should be done, some techniques and tricks. What we should use when we clip the hair. Does it matter where we clip? We're going to look at some current recommendations surrounding the location of clipping the hair, and then we'll transition to issues with cleanup of the remnant hair, as well as talk about some of the possible risk factors that could potentially lead to infection and possible solutions with vacuum-assisted technology with airborne dispersal of hair. So let's begin. So why do we clip hair prior to surgery? Well, the presence of hair can interfere with the surgical field of vision and is associated with the lack of cleanliness. It is remo its removal is linked to infection prophylaxis. HAI outbreaks have occasionally been traced to organisms associated with the hair or the scalp, whether that's Staph aureus or Group A Staphylococcus. Well, why not with the controversy that's surrounding hair removal? Why with not would we look at overall issues of impacting the SSI or HII strategy? So hair is a source of potential contamination, and we can see why with the microbial ecology of the skin surface. If we just pick two of the most popular surgical sites, such as a midline incision for general surgery, or even a hand for orthopedics, the amount of bacteria per cubic centimeter on an abdomen can be anywhere up to about four logs, or 10,000 colony forming units per square centimeter. So that's really a size of a dime. With 80% of our bacteria, that are on our skin or within the first five layers of the skin, where's the remaining 20% of that bacteria? It's also in the hair follicles and sweat glands. So it's not surprising that the hair can be a source or a potential source of contamination. 
So there's many variables that look at contributing to a, an HAI risk. And pre op factors such as poor body habitus or even non-compliance with showering, if we look at this fishbone diagram, it is a good way to illustrate that there are so many perioptive factors or pre op factors, patient factors, surgeon factors that all contribute to an, a surgical outcome. So it's not surprising if we look at hair removal and environmental contamination, why it's so important to have an HAI avoidance. Any of these factors can lead to poor surgical outcomes. So in a recent survey, amongst 250 AOR men, uh, members about the perceived importance of infection prevention practices, they looked at the overall interventions that were utilized. So they looked at skin antiseptic, um, hand scrubs, even, you know, the showers night before surgery, loose hair clipping, control of or limited traffic in that OR, and whether clinicians were appropriately, you know, using um, head coverings. And overall, when they surveyed from an importance of five and one to least importance, they really looked at hair clipping as just as important of a interventional factor or complete removal of that hair from that patient's area or around that OR environment, just as important as the limiting the traffic in that OR. So there's always been a controversy of to clip or not to clip, but what do the recommendations say? Well, the CDC and AORN recommend that hair should not be removed unless the hair is at or around the incision and it will interfere with the surgical procedure. Most common procedures that we use hair removal would be with the orthopedics, cardiovascular, whether it's from what we consider chin to toes, neurosurgery, even ob -gyne. But not clipping, remember, if you're using an alcohol-based skin antiseptic, does require extended dry time. There is a lot of variation or variability regarding clipping, and oftentimes it comes down to the surgeon preference. Dry time is especially important to the CMS, if you're not using it, or if you're using an alcohol-based skin antiseptic and the hair has not been clipped, it may take longer to dry. In addition, AORN also recommends clipping the hair if to reduce the risk of fire hazard if you're using an alcohol-based antiseptic. So the question still remains, should we shave or should we clip? Well, this has really been answered many, many years ago with SKIP. What we do know is that many surgeons are starting to trend back to the shaving because they feel that they need to have that baby, baby bottom smooth um, clip or shave. And in fact, leaving stubble is okay. And the reason why is if we look at the pictures that, uh, you know, before clipping or before shaving and after clipping and after shaving, we can see that there's a source of pathogens that most HIIs have within a skin dwelling microorganism. Razors, shaving, clipping increases these infection prevention risks by causing micro nicks, cuts, and abrasions that can um, have these microorganisms dwell and multiply. These organisms may migrate into that incision. So what we always say is you don't want to start the incision before the incision is started. So there's multiple studies that show lower HIIs with clipping versus shaving. The most recent ones were in 2010 that shows that using a razor the night before surgery, infection rates were about 3.1 versus clipping at a 0.5%. Most recognize that if clipping is going to be done, it should be done the morning of surgery and not the night before. So based on this evidence, this US as well as international guidelines overwhelmingly recommend clippers instead of razors. And as you can see, whether it's AORN, CDC, HICPAC, IHI, or even SKIP, these additional agencies and guideline committee recommendations, perioperative hair removal by clipping rather than shaving is one of the, the surgical care improvement projects or SKIP's sentinel core measures. In an era of value-based purchasing and optimization, of these core measures, it's important that financial implications for hospitals and other acute facilities is really taken into consideration. It is clear that these recommendations are working since 98% of our surgical nurses are clipping rather than shaving the patients according to a recent AORN survey. So when to clip, does timing truly matter? Well, different views or different reviews make different conclusions. 
while the Cochrane review by Tanner determined no difference in HII risk associated with timing of the surgical hair removal, Manogram in the CDC guidelines concluded that hair clipping immediately before an operation is associated with a lower risk of an HAI if they clip the night before. So there's also other several studies that are highlighted by the CDC, for example, that multiple studies showed HAI risks were lower immediately when clipped immediately before surgery. So for example, 1.8% versus the night before at 4.0. Another older study by Serapin showed that shaving immediately before the operation compared to shaving within 24 hours preoperatively was associated with a decrease in HII risk, so a 3.1 versus a 7.1. But if they were to shave 24 hours prior to the operation, it showed that an HII risk exceeded 20%. So looking at clipping inside that OR or in pre-op, what are the recommendations are truly show? Well, we do know that the CDC and AORN recommends hair clipping or hair removal to be performed outside of that OR environment. Because clipping is associated with airborne dispersal of hair, it has a lengthy cleanup and possibly contamination of that operative field. So some observational data and surveys that actually showed actual practice most clipping is still done inside that OR environment. So if we look at some of the top five reasons or so why we're still clipping in that, inside that OR, it, the top five would be surgeon preference, patient privacy, insufficient clipping outside of that OR. There's a lack of time to do it into that pre-op area with you know, some room turnovers and high efficiencies. And then no set policy at their institution. And then lastly, they felt that they were not trained appropriately to use the clipper um, outside of that OR environment. So in summary, the presence of hair will interfere with, with the surgical procedure and removal is the best interest of that patient. The following precautions can be taken. So hair removal should be performed the day of surgery in a location outside of that OR or procedure room only hair interfering with the surgical procedure should be removed, and hair should be clipped using a single-use electric or battery-operated clipper or clipper with a reusable head so that it can be disinfected between patients. And clipping has been associated with lower HAI uh, risk than shaving, and it is more cost-effective. So let's discuss why surgical clipping is now the standard Let's talk about some issues around surgical clipping themselves because it does not go without a few issues. So technique is critical. Manufacturer's directions for use and appropriate training is essential for safe use of surgical clippers. The direction, the angle, the blade type are all fundamentals for proper use of the successful clipping. We got away from shaving because of the potential Rick's, Nick's cuts and abrasions but clipping does leave a stubble behind to alleviate some of these concerns. As you can see from the pictures on the right are horrendous. This is a, a technique issue that we call and have seen, it's called raking. It's very common if um, some of the, uh, the, uh, the nurses or techs who are towing inward or actually flipping over a clipper, clipper it can cause these scrape marks and it can result in portable for microorganisms to be migrating into some of these wounds. Healthcare workers may attempt multiple passes as well if the body parts are very hairy, and multiple passes increases that risk or skin damage. So some additional issues with clipping of the hair is really the cleanup and the waste surrounding that patient as well as the environment that it's in. Hair clippings can contain the same pathogenic bacteria in normal flora as the skin. This hair and airborne particulates left behind in the surgical arena on that patient can get into the linens and even on the floor, can contaminate surgical environment and may increase the HAI risk. And in some incidences, they've actually seen airborne dispersal of hair upward to about a foot away from that patient after clipping. So looking at the problem of cleanup of this clipped hair with adhesive tape and sticky mitts, 
potential contamination of the hair, linens, and what have you goes everywhere else in that hospital. So if we think it's only a sentinel event within that particular patient, we do know that it goes absolutely everywhere. I don't know how many times we've actually seen um, tape rolls or what have you that have remnants of other hair from previous patients. Um, it's not something that we would like to see. We try to minimize that. But adhesive tapes and sticky mats are commonly used for this cleanup and they carry their own issues. Um, they're not sterilized. They're not kept under control conditions. And the same tape ropes are frequently used on multiple different patients and often containing hair from the previous cases. On a recent survey, 70% of nurses, they say that they've sometimes or always noticed contamination on that tape roll that's left in that drawer, and how many of us have actually seen these unmentionable hairs within that tape on that drawer? So looking at, at adhesive tape contamination in itself, Redemeyer set out to discover how many adhesive tape contributions or how they contribute to the cross-contamination with a hypothesis that adhesive tape rolls may become colonized with organisms and contribute to that HAI. Well, his study examined the contamination rates of those rolls of adhesive tape at a large hospital, and what they found is 40 used tape rolls were collected throughout the hospital. So we're gonna call that the active group. And with two centimeter samples taken from each of these rolls and incubated in a ACGAR medium for about one day, what they actually saw that 74% of these tape specimens that were collected were colonized with pathogenic bacteria. And some of these specimens exhibited polymicrobial growth. So the active group actually showed a significant group, a significant growth in colony forming units or specimens between 24 and 59 were had numerous counts of bacteria within them. Another study went from Berkowitz in an ICU about a, of a 50, uh, 560 bed teaching hospital looked at 24 fresh rolls of adhesive tape that were open. They were tested to make sure that they were free of microorganisms and then placed in the ICU. So 13 were placed immediately and 11 were, were kept in the storage cabinet. At intervals of the first one day, five days, and seven days after initial culturing, each roll was recultured in its location within that unit. And what they found were 100% of adhesive tape rolls, 23 that became contaminated with opportunistic bacteria, including Pseudomonas E. coli Klebsiella, and five of these 23 tape rolls had migrated to at least one other different location in that unit. So this really shows a demonstration of additional risk from cross-contamination standpoint. So yet another study by Harris sought to determine whether or not surgical adhesive tape had potential to act as a fomite within that healthcare setting. Many of us had taken this tape roll and moved a few inches thinking that it was clean, when in fact we know much differently from Harris that it wasn't that this study actually showed that the side surface of these tape rolls, so the outer edges, were contaminated with greater numbers of bacteria than the circumferential surface, so that's where we actually pull the tape off the roll. And the researchers theorized that there were seven or several reasons why this actually occurred. Well, it's because those side surfaces of the tape were greater, had greater surface area from bacterial growth, that the tape rolls often were placed on the sides inside the drawer, and that exposure to those areas and that sticky surface led to other environmental services. And then side surfaces were coated with a sticky tacky residue from that adhesive substance that was a tape, which causes a greater number of bacteria and particulates to adhere to that surface. So what they actually showed is that removing a portion of that surface adhesive tape, so that two inches or that three inches, actually made no difference um, in removal because the bacteria was still clearly on the side surface. So if we look at, lastly, the disposal of these adhesive tape rolls, well, one particular roll of tape has about 10 yards. So in some other studies, they looked at two studies in particular summarized by an article of Love illustrated that the impact of disposing of 10 yards of tape into a medical waste stream that an average hospital uses about one yard of tape out of the 10 yards and about two yards in each hospital res respectively. So this project was really 
looking at the usage of the annual activity and results to a combined waste of tape, about 20,000 rolls of tape or about 126 miles of tape discarding these unused tape rolls. So if it wasn't enough argument against adhesive tape rolls, well, sticky mitts and tape rolls also cause damage on that skin. It causes skin stripping, as well as micro abrasions and some other common problems associated with the tape. The, tip can, the tape can cause damage with, to friable skin, as well as cause adverse skin reactions. When we look at the overall efficiency in cleanup of surgical clipping, time is of an impact. Time associated with clipping cleanup and using tape and sticky mats has not been well documented. However, in the same survey that I mentioned earlier conducted through AORN of these 250 surgical personnel, they reported an average cleanup of clipping from, from a standard clip up for about 4.2 minutes per case. And we do know that operative time is money. So if we're clipping inside that OR, an average amount, dollar amount for a per minute in the OR environment is about $62 per minute. So it does add up. Even more reason why we should be clipping in a outside environment according to the CDC and AORN guidelines. So how does this really compare to your practice? Are you still clipping inside that OR or are you clipping in that pre-op area? And is tape an effective cleaning up? Is it really effective to use that sticky mitt? While little data exists to quantify how much that hair is actually picked up with using a tape methodology. In a same survey, only half the respondents thought when they used the tape method or the sticky mitt method that about 90% of the loose clip hair was still inside of that OR environment. So still on the sheets and what have you. So looking at some new technology to help eliminate and speed up that cleanup technology, uh, speed up the process. So in a recent study in 2016, Edmonston performed um, a study on some newer technology. And it really looked at the clipping duration, the amount of loose hair, some of the microbial contamination with a cross comparison between a standard clipper and a clipper fitted with a vacuum assisted device. And then lastly, how much of that tape was really pulling up the remnant bacteria as well as the hair that was removed um, from that particular patient. And what he actually saw and looked at, so he trained about 18 nurses or so on how to clip with a clipper as well as with a vacuum assisted device. And overall, he was looking at assessing total clipping, the cleanup times between a standard clipper as well as a vacuum assisted device. He measured particular matter or the hair contamination prior to the clipping as well as afterwards. And then he looked at transepidermal water loss. And what does that really measure? And why, are, why should we look at that? Well, if we look at transepidermal water loss and why it's so important is because the skin is comprised of those three primary layers. It has the epidermis, the dermis, and then the hypodermis. When water passes through that dermis or the epidermis, it evaporates through that skin. So this is really known as transepidermal loss or what we consider tool, and it, which leads to drying and cracking in that skin. So measurements of tool may be useful to identify whether that skin is, is damaged or it, by certain chemicals or by a physical insult such as tape stripping or other pathological conditions. So some of his results looked at the cleanup time with a standard clipper. So here are some of his, his results. So from a standard clipper on a chest and a groin, he looked at the clipper versus the vacuum assisted device and looking at the time difference between those two. So if we look at the chest, it took about 320 seconds or about five minutes for the standard clipper and about 191 or three minutes for a vacuum assisted device. When looking at that hair particular contamination with or without, there is a decrease in particular hair with a vacuum assisted device. And the same reduction occurred in microbial contamination in both the chest and the groin. 
When Dr. Edmondson looked at the tool or transepidermal water loss on the chest, he also found a significant difference from the use of a standard clipper to a vacuum-assisted device. And of course, again, these measurements may be useful to identify whether there's skin damage or not. Lastly, he looked at the tape that was being used to remove this loose hair. He found that the surgical tape did harbor a significant micro burden on the chest as well as the groin. And overall, if we look at some of the implementations and inclusions, this is what he found that the vacuum assisted device resulted in a significant reduction in the amount of time required to clip and clean up dispersed hair compared to a standard surgical clipper. Also, this vacuum assisted device eliminated the need to physically remove the dispersed hairs from the operative field and could harbor significant micro burden. Lastly, he observed an increase in the tool, in a, which suggests that with a standard clipper, possibly can damage the barrier function of the epidermis. And then an independent rating. So the surgical clipper versus the surgical clipper with a vacuum assisted device by the nurses and study subjects suggested that there was a perceived benefit where they had an increased speed of clipping as well as the increase in cleanliness and they felt a little bit more comfortable uh, experience for that particular patient. So this is the clip back device that Dr. Edmondson uh, performed the study on and it is a single solution for more than effective and efficient hair removal. It's small, it's portable, it has a battery operated um, device with a single use tip. It also has a filtered reservoir it's specifically designed to fit the BD surgical clipper for a complete clipping solution. A little bit more about the clip back. It is rugged APS uh, plastic housing and it has a carrying strap. It can be wiped clean very easily with a standard portable wipe or any other type of um, antimicrobial device. It has a lithium ion battery that lasts about 75 minutes, so it takes about four hours to fully charge. And looking at the overall filter capacity, it has a average of 98.5% of filtering capacity of the hair and debris around it. It captures um, down to a 0.3 micron of the filter. It is a single use, non-sterile, latex free. It can be recyclable. So the blue portion that you see um, that collects the hair can be removed and the tubing and the actual device that uh, attaches the clipper can be recyclable. So we can't talk about clipping and some of the issues around it if we don't talk about best practice for optimal clipping as well as the use of a clip back. So what we have actually seen for some best practice is this patient skin should be clean and dry. It needs to be appropriate blade type depending on this particular area. And the BD surgical clipper has three different blades that can be attached. You hold the clipper at a 45 degree angle to that patient. So between the thumb and forefinger, underneath, and similar to what, we're, what we consider holding a pen or a pencil with a standard or, or a standard overgrip. The glide face the blade should be gently across the surface skin. So it should be, the skin should be pulled taut and against the grain of the hair. Um, for best results, we don't want you to rake or toe in the clipper or flip it over. So you can see in the picture, it should be flush to the skin and just gently glide forward. When using the clip back, make sure you pull that tubing taut prior to be placing onto the vacuum and gently glide the clip back and clipper against the skin without pushing downward. This is a gentle motion. It's not about pound of pressure or friction. Um, the vacuum will actually just vacuum up the hair as it goes through. A few other best practices that we talked about is always look at manufacturer's direction for use and training are essential for safe use of any surgical clipper or vacuum assisted device. Always clip in the direction and the angle of the blade that it's intended to be. No raking or pressure or towing inward or flipping over the clipper. It can cause sever uh, severely damage the skin and create a portal for microorganisms resulting in a cancellation or, or even delay of surgery. In multiple passes, we sometimes think that more is better, sometimes it's just more. And passing over multiple times very quickly can cause damage to that skin. 
So a single slow pass works the best when you're talking about clipping or what have you. So in summary, it's more than just a mess. Hair and airborne particulates left behind in that patient, whether it's on the linen, on the floor, from surgical clipping, can potentially contaminate that perioperative environment. Adhesives, tapes, as well as sticky mats used to clean up the mess are not kept under control conditions, and these same rolls of tape are frequently used in multiple patients, often containing hair from previous cases. 74% of those tape specimens collected in one hospital were colonized with pathogenic bacteria, and 70% of these nurses surveyed said that they noticed a contamination or a contaminated roll in that tape drawer when they went to go look for some. In addition, the clip back clips and collects hair all in one step. The surgical grade filter effectively captures about 98.5% of the clipped hair and debris down to a 0.3 micron. Only half of the OR surveyed thought that it, you had complete removal, about 90% of the loose hair when using tape methods or a sticky method. The clip back filter contains a containing all of the vacuum material is disposed of after each use. It has a risk or reduces the risk for cross-contamination when other tape rolls are used. It is a one-step process. It is efficient and it saves time with each case. If you would like more information or resources, please reach out to your clipback representative at www.bd.com slash clipback. Thank you so much for your time today and please feel free to ask any questions. Thank you so much, Lena. We've just got a couple of questions, actually. Um, one is, how long does the battery last? So fully charged, the battery will run about 75 minutes. Okay, and does it work on other clippers or is it just exclusive to BD? It is exclusive to BD. It only works on the BD Clipper. Okay. Um, and the last question I've got actually is, is how do I reach a BD rep? Right. So um, you can actually log on to the website at bd.com and um, look at the customer service tab. And at that point, you can actually have a customer service reach out to your local rep if you are unaware of who your local uh, rep is. Okay, that's great. We don't appear to have any other questions at the moment. So attendees, if you do think of a question after the webinar is finished, please uh, email, email us here at uh, webinar at mdpublishing.com and we will try and pass on your information to Lena. So with that, I'd like to thank you for a great and informative webinar, Lena. Uh, one lucky attendee today will win an Amazon gift card for completing the post-webinar survey, which will appear on your screen shortly. Please, just a reminder that today's webinar is not eligible for a continuing education credit. For more information on our upcoming OR Today webinars, please visit our website, ortoday.com forward slash webinars. Thank you again for your time, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day, and see you next time.